Starry Messenger comes from Galileo, where he first perfects the telescope. After only just having heard that a telescope was invented in, in the Netherlands, he said, oh my gosh, that's, let me make my own version of it. And he makes the best version that exists in the world, observes the night sky, notices that Venus goes through phases, which can only happen if Venus is going around the sun and not around Earth. Uh, it could, he notices that the sun has spots, the moon has craters, the Jupiter has moons that orbit it. He didn't call them moons, they were called Jupiter's stars, because why would you think they were moons, who knows? And he reports this with the first evidence that Earth is not the center of all motion. And he called it Sidereus Nuncius, starry messenger. The starry messenger wasn't him. The starry messenger was these messages themselves from the sky that are conflicting with prevailing belief systems about humans and about Earth. And he got into big trouble with the church. So what I, as an astrophysicist, I found all the starry messages I could and applied them to our plight here on Earth. And that's the summary of what's going on in that book. Yeah, so you look up and the planets are going forward against the background stars and then backwards and we call that, there's a word for that, retrograde, and they do a loop to loop and nobody understands it. And the fact that no one understands it is presented as evidence in some bits of scholarship as evidence for the divinity of the heavens because that is the handiwork of God and we are mortal and God is immortal and omniscient and so we can't possibly know the mind of God. So you're just content just in your ignorance watching planets. There were some attempts at this with the geocentric epicycles and all of this, but this was, it was well accepted that you'll never understand. Newton comes along, writes down equations of motion, equations of gravity, and kind of on a dare, he invents integral and differential calculus. So he writes down these equations and he can now demonstrate full knowledge of how, why, and where, and what the planets are doing. And so potent was his new theory of gravity that it worked for moons of Jupiter orbiting Jupiter, not just planets orbiting the sun. And this was the first indication, maybe this is not just a local truth, that maybe it applies across the universe. And this was a little bit of heresy thought by some, that in fact, Newton was accused by some say, uh, uh, Isaac, you've left nothing for God to do. And that's simultaneously a, a dig at him, but also quite a compliment that he can actually understand the mind of God. It was not obvious. There's no, there's no tablet in the sky that required that the laws of physics we discover on Earth's surface would apply elsewhere. If they were different on Earth than on the moon and on the sun, I, I suppose we could deal with that. But what a remarkable fact that it is the same. Well, I, you know, it was my first visit to the Hayden Planetarium, where I now serve as director. Nine years old, a family visit. As a family, we, you know, we went to all the all the places in the city. We went to the zoo, you know, the art museum, and, and I think my parents were just, it, it was a matter of exposure for my brother, my sister, and me. And you don't want your options to be limited when you're asked what do you want to, what do you want to be when you grow up. And the more things you see as a child, the more options you have to reach for if something piques your interest. And for me, a first visit to the planetarium, I've, I'm convinced, in fact, that it was the universe that chose me. Then you have to be good at something in school, which I gather was math. Well, so ma I liked math, but I, I think it, it's wrong to say you have to be good at it. I'd rather say you have to want to be good at it. And then ambition kicks in. And ambition can override whether or not your first foray was unpleasant or you didn't do well or maybe you flunked an exam. But if you really like it, you will spend time learning it. That's, sure. how, that's what liking something means. Maybe too many of us believe that we like something because you're good at it. And sure, there are plenty of cases where that's so, but why deny yourself the pleasure of a life of pursuit of something that brings pleasure? Cyril is my father and Sunchita is my mother. 
they were a moral influence, a cultural influence. And I will add, not that you explicitly ask this, but I think it fits right in this moment. Um, consider the period, the 1960s. You could go one of two ways if you're an angry black man. It's like you can raise your fist and threaten violence as a retaliation of the violence against you, or you can find some other way that doesn't involve violence, that involves some kind of peace, some kind of understanding. And my father, and while he grew up in the 30s and 40s, he served in a segregated army, okay? So the stuff he lived through, and while I have my own stories, none of them compare to his average story. Yet at the end of the day, he was never bitter. I remembered him saying, when you look at the images of angry white people screaming at black children entering a school who are protected by the National Guard because an edict had to be delivered to grant them access to education, he would say, they simply don't know any better. They were raised that way. You want to hate them. And my father never hated. Never. So I go through life and at least several times a week, every week of my life, growing up, I have stories. Today they would call them microaggressions, but then it was just same shit, different day. But I never got bitter because you asked, what influence did they have on me? It was the non-bitter influence. You say, that's they don't know any better. They think they're doing the right thing. Maybe we can make a difference going forward. I think we need that today. The world, I, I reached a point where, okay, how long can I keep talking about the universe and not bring it down to earth? Not bring some science principles to people's thinkings. They want to tribalize. They want to hate. They want to choose. They want to create laws to restrict your freedoms just because of who you worship or don't worship or who you sleep with or what you look like or what, you know, how reflective to light your skin color is, right? What side of a line in the sand you were born on. I like invoking an alien trope. Aliens, they don't know anything about us. They just see this beautiful planet with water on it and continents and clouds and they visit and they say, oh, this is cool. Oh, this is one species that's everywhere. Oh, they're very successful. They are humans and homo sapiens. And heck, that's cool. And then they get a little closer look and they say, oh my gosh. What are they? There's a war over here. Why? Oh, because there's some resource on this side that's not over there, and they want it. There's a coastline. There's oil. There's this. There's a, uh, elements in a mine. They, 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 they worship a different god. To look at the violence and hatred that we commit upon each other, and they'll run back home and tell their fellow alien brethren, there's no sign of intelligent life on Earth. <laughs> so... Anyhow, so I've, I've, yeah, my head has been in the stars, but my feet have been on earth my entire life. A person can be a mentor even if they don't say anything because you can observe them, observe their conduct, their, their behavior, their, how they respond to adversity. Do they fight back? Do they want to commit violence? Do they want to have a conversation to explore the differences? Yeah, so that, that, this was, for me, one of the most insightful lessons that I got from all the stories from him. Yeah, so he, uh, he was a, an athlete, actually world-class uh, track. Uh, that's its own story because he, he was... Uh, kind of muscular, mm. all right, certainly in his day. Not Charles Atlas muscular, but uh, relative to other kids in his class. In high school, he was muscular. 
and they were in their gym class and you line up and getting ready for the next unit. Mm -hmm. All right, there was gymnastics and then there was like track and field. So they had the track unit and the gym teacher pointed to my father on the line and said, oh, we're about to do the running unit and just so you know, um, do you see Cyril Tyson over there? And then would turns. He says, he has the kind of body that would not make a good runner. And he said to himself, no one is going to tell me what I can't do in this world. And he started running. And he became world class. And at one point, he had the fifth fastest time in the world in his special event. So that was an, that's an important lesson, career lesson. Why are there people running around telling you what you can't accomplish? In, in a free society? I can get it if we're not a free society. But why should anyone tell you what you can't or shouldn't do? So that was lesson number one for me. But then, his best friend, also a runner, Johnny Johnson is his name. There's a race. Johnny Johnson is running around on the last turn of the track. And there's a runner from the New York Athletic Club several paces behind him. The coach of that runner goes up the side of the track and screams to his runner as he points to Johnny Johnson ahead of him, catch that. Johnny Johnson overheard this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and all Johnny Johnson said to himself was, this is one he ain't going to catch <laughs> just and increase the distance. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, so that comment from the coach could have done one of two things. It could have demotivated you because then you wallow in the racism of the world, or it could motivate you to succeed. Ever since I heard that story, every racist encounter I have ever had simply motivates me to succeed all the more, period. Yeah, and again, this is not the kind of racism that the 1950s or 40s, you know, I wasn't lynched. So again, I don't want to claim equal trauma to what earlier generations had experienced, but you can get, let's call it institutional racism, where you don't even- Not even, even racism. I'm talking about people trying to put you off your passion, telling no, you it's not- that's, I call yeah. that racism. What I'm saying is, really? they see that I'm athletic, I've been athletic most of my life, and they can't wrap their head around me being something other than an athlete that they watch on television. When I say, well, I actually like astrophysics, but you're so good at this other sport. No, I want to be in the physics club. No, we, we need you on the, the basketball team. And they think they're doing me a favor. They think they're saying nice things to me. But every one of those is a force operating against my ambitions. And so in a way, just that my skin color in my life's arc was a path of most resistance compared to where I wanted to land. And by the way, I don't, you're, we're, we're, we just spent a half hour talking about this and I hardly ever talk about it. I don't talk about it because I don't, you know, I don't need to, maybe if, if it's a counseling session, but I'm perfectly fine. I'm a happy guy, happily married, got two kids, and uh, I hardly ever talk about skin color because I, I want to make it irrelevant as quickly as I possibly can in every context I'm possibly in. So if you're going to invite me to give a public talk in February, Black History Month, I will decline that invitation. If you only think of me as a black scientist, then I have failed as a scientist. Period. Period. Okay, so Isaac Newton is the first to understand that white light is composed of colors. So he takes white light, puts it through a prism, and he gets Roy G. Biv. Actually, the indigo, he had a mystical fascination with the number seven, mm -hmm. so he wanted to lay down seven colors. Oh. But indigo is just really blue-violet, all right? Okay. But anyhow, we'll give him his indigo because he did all that stuff before he turned 26. So <laughs> if you invent calculus just on a dare, we give it to you, all right? We'll give you indigo if you need to have indigo. So he's got the colors, and then he took those colors, merged them back together, and he got white light out the other side. That's some freaky stuff. 
That's mm -hmm. just freaky. Yeah. That red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet equals white. Yeah. Okay. So we're good there. William Herschel comes around later and says, I wonder, just to even ask this question, I wonder if the different colors of light have different temperatures. So he laid down the spectrum with sunlight prism, and he put a thermometer in each color. And then he had a, an eighth thermometer. I don't know if he used one and did the experiment eight, seven times, but he had another thermometer that he used as the control thermometer. You put that over to the side where there are no colors. And that would presumably just measure the room temperature. So he knows enough to even think that this is an interesting exercise, and he's got a control thermometer. And he just puts it over to the side of the red, out of sight. And then he watches the, th the thermometers. And the control thermometer goes through the roof. Yes, it does. And, and, and he's looking at it, and he says, something must be coming through this, the prism that I cannot see. And he describes this as light unfit for vision. Yeah. <laughs> yes, he does. He discovers infrared light with that experiment. If you go to the hardware store and get an infrared bulb, and you turn it on and it looks red, you're seeing the red light that is also emitted from this infrared bulb, and the heat that you feel, your eye cannot see, that's all the infrared that you're buying when you pay money for that bulb. Yeah. And then some other guy put a piece of paper on the other side of violet, and it turned dark, and he pretty yeah, much- Photographic paper. Photographic paper. And he found that it, respond, it responded in the way you would normally respond by putting photographic paper in front of visible light. So he concludes, that was somebody else later. Somebody else, yeah. Right, and says, there's something be beyond the light. There's something less than the red, infrared, something beyond the, the violet. And thus was discovered ultraviolet light. Yeah. And so, to pose the question in the first place was a stroke of brilliance. To then trust your measurements on a level where you then declare you have made that discovery is a whole other thing. It's a, yeah, it's, yeah. Here's the thing about this book. I just because I well, that story I, is told in the book, you, just so people get a sense of the history yeah. of, of, of the history of puzzlement and the history of discovery rolled up into one. Oh, yeah, so I had, there, was, there, was, there was an incident in Pasadena, California. I was there. I don't drink much coffee. I don't have a relationship with caffeine. But every now and then, I'll be delighted to have a nice cup of hot cocoa. And I went to one of these coffee houses, you know, with the chalkboard out front. And so I had, you know the kind I'm talking about. They're all over Brooklyn. You trip on the chalkboards in Brooklyn. <laughs> so, so I'm in there. I order hot chocolate. And I order it with whipped cream. Of course, right? And it comes to the table, and there's no whipped cream. And I said, I ordered this with whipped cream. And they said, oh, we put it on. And I said, well, where is it? Oh, he said, it's sunk to the bottom. <laughs> I then said, <laughs> either, the laws of physics that apply <laughs> everywhere in the universe are suspended in your coffee shop, <laughs> or you didn't put whipped cream on my hot cocoa. <laughs> and he looked indignant. Really? <laughs> now, to his credit, rather than continue to argue with me, he intended to prove me wrong. Oh. So he went into the kitchen, brought out the, the whipped cream, scooped it up, popped it in my, in my hot cocoa, and it bobbed once and floated atop. <laughs> and there it was. <laughs> did you of invite, course did whipped cream, you invite it to push of it. course whipped cream has to float. <laughs> because first of all, before it was whipped cream, it was cream, okay? <laughs> and old timers remember, what does cream do in unhomogenized milk? It floats to the top and you skim off the cream, leaving behind skim milk, okay? <laughs> this is how that works. Now you take the heavy cream and then whip it, putting air into it. 
It is not gonna sink on any known liquid devised by man. So, so here's my point. The lesson there is, uh, I'm, I'm a fan of the edict, if an argument lasts more than five minutes, then both sides are wrong. It applies maybe 85% of the time. It's a good, it's a good uh, tenet to, to carry with you. Now watch. Um, this is how science works. One researcher comes up with a result. And that is not the truth. No, no. A scientific emergent truth is not the result of any one experiment. What has to happen is somebody else has to verify it. Preferably a competitor. Preferably someone who doesn't want you to be correct. <laughs> such as my waiter. <laughs> he went out to prove me wrong and got the same result that I had declared. We can call that the beginnings of an emergent truth about whipped cream. <laughs> now we need someone to do it in Asia and in Europe and, 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 and then you get a trend and you can then declare that a consensus of observation and experiments has emerged in the scientific community. Whipped cream floats on hot chocolate. And that waiter today is getting a PhD in buoyancy. <laughs> Uh, I can tell you this, that if you don't have a, I didn't realize when I was nine how unusual it was to be that passionate that young. Not until I got to college, half the people my freshman year didn't yet know what they wanted to major in. And I said, I'm majoring in astrophysics. They say, was that because it was early in the catalog, alphabetically, of things you might major? No, I felt this and known this half my life. And so I, I, in college, I was sensitized to people who were still looking, still searching. Well, we have the benefit of longer life expectancy today than 50 years ago. I mention this only because if you don't know, want to be, if you don't know what you want to be when you grow up and you're 30, that's just fine. But I don't want to have to blame you for not exposing yourself to what you can be when you grow up. If you're sitting home watching football and say, I don't know what I want to do with my life, why don't you do what my parents did? Visit a new thing every weekend. Go on a trip. Talk to experts in all manner of tasks. And, uh, you know, visit a chef school. Visit a, uh, a geology uh, expedition. Do, just do things. And if you like it, you'll probably be better at that than anything else you choose to do. Because you, you will invest even your downtime doing it. And as the saying goes, pick something you would do for free and make that your career. And you'll never live a sad day in your life. So that's one variant on a pick something that you love. And all the time when other people say, you know, I need a vacation from this job. You, you're going to say, vacation? What's that? I'm, people say that to me. Do you want a vacation from, from what? From the astrophysics you're doing. But I like what I'm doing. If I'm on vacation, on, oh, by the way, I love being on the beach. But if I'm on the beach, I'm thinking about <laughs> the, the universe. <laughs> it's not to get away from the universe. All right? Not that that could literally happen anyway. Uh, so uh, that's what I would say. You want to be independent-minded. Listen to people's comments. People have life experience. Don't ignore it. But what you want to do is fold it in to your own sensibilities, provided you have sensibilities to begin with. Otherwise, you become this ping-pong ball uh, batted back and forth between one person's suggestion and another. Well, first of all, the universe is expanding, and there is more and more observable universe all the time. Mm -hmm. The universe at its edge is expanding at one light year per year. That's how that works. And so <laughs> in a billion years, the edge is not gonna be 14 billion light years away, it'll be 15 billion light years away. So we got that, okay. So now, galaxies 13 billion light years away, we are seeing light emitted by that galaxy and that light has been traveling for 13 billion years, okay. Um, 
yes, that galaxy emitted its light when the universe was 10% its current age, and in fact was much smaller than it is today. Now you said the current paradigm is 14 billion year age of the universe. You said that with a little bit of, oh, you'll come up with something different later. Um, the proper way to say that is, that is the current measurements of the age of the universe. That's how that works, okay? Um, paradigm is, be, came into our lexicon um, in a big way in the 1970s with a book written by the uh, science philosopher uh, Thomas Kuhn. So um, this book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, um, sort of introduced paradigm as a, as, a, as a way that scientists sort of gather around a paradigm and they all sort of accept it. Although then something different happens and better data comes along that we all gather around a different paradigm. Uh, that happened basically until the dawn of the age of modern science, which I date from Galileo and, uh, and um, Bacon, uh, Francis Bacon, where when you experimentally measure something be to be true and it's verified, that is a truth that does not later turn out to be false, period. It's not how science works. It's not like, oh, this is now, that's gonna be false, now let's all crowd around this. You would be left with that impression having read that book. But the book got that very wrong for the age of modern science. Before then, sure, because people just thought stuff up and then, and called themselves scientists and that was with philosophers. And you turn out to be profoundly wrong when somebody else thought up something better and then everybody's wrong when we finally started taking data. It's all about the data. Okay, so uh, everything you described is just perfectly fine. Yes, it finds galaxies. The next telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope, is tuned to live in that regime to find galaxies being born in the early universe. So there'll be a whole lot more data coming back from the early universe when that telescope gets launched, lands at its observing point and gets turned on. So there's nothing you said that's odd or weird. That is the universe we live in. So the cosmic perspective is incompatible with your ego. Or I should say, your ego is incompatible with the cosmic perspective. That's the proper way to order that sentence. The cosmic perspective shows you how small we are in size, in time, in space. And if you go in with a high ego, you might resist that. You might say, no, I'm important. I... But I think of it differently. The... We know one of the greatest gifts of modern astrophysics to civilization, dare I call it a gift, is the knowledge that the atoms of your body are traceable not only to the Big Bang origin of the universe itself, but especially to stars that have manufactured those elements and later in their lives on death exploded, scattering that enrichment across gas clouds so that their next generation of stars would have planets and on at least one of those planets, life. So, we are not just figuratively, we are literally stardust. So when you go out and look up at the night sky, yeah, your urge is I'm small and that's large. And yes, you're alive in this universe, but there's another way to look at it. The universe is alive within you. You have kinship with the cosmos. That feeling, to me, is greater than any ego you could have possibly walked into the room with. First, that feeling borders on spiritual. Second. Third, we have trained ourselves to equate being special with being different. You're special. You do something, thinks some way that no one else does. So I'm special. Well, let me turn that on its head and say, maybe we're special 
not because we're different, but because we're the same. All humans are stardust. All humans share a chemistry with all, a biology with all other life on earth. There's one genesis on this earth. We have DNA in, you have DNA in common with a banana. <laughs> <laughs> you can ask, well, where are the arms and legs? No, DNA goes deeper than that. DNA controls chemistry. It controls metabolism. It controls all kinds of things that are prescribed in the DNA, and that's where we have commonality with other life forms on earth. So why not look around and say, I'm not special because I'm a different. I'm special because I'm the same as you, as others, as the tree, as the brook, as the animals, you know, the woodland creatures. And we can all sit here and look up at the night sky and say, yes, we have kinship with the cosmos. I feel large because of that, not small. What I have found is is an urge people have to search for meaning. Is it under this rock, behind, metaphorically, right? Is it under a rock? I'm going to search on, is there meaning there? Is it behind a tree? Is, if, if I join this group, will, that, will, be, will I find meaning with them? If I, and I think, to my, okay, go ahead. But what you're doing is relegating meaning in your life to a search. And suppose you don't find meaning. That'd be a force of disappointment in your life. You're setting yourself up to be disappointed if you don't find meaning. So I have another idea. <clears throat> I, I use this for myself. I, it may or may not work for others. I recognized long ago that in a free society where I'm not enslaved and I'm not you know, an indentured servant and I have some freedom of choice, that I have the power to manufacture meaning in my life. I can make decisions about my own life that create the meaning. For me, a meaningful life is learning something new tomorrow that I didn't know yesterday. Otherwise, it's a wasted day. You know the prisoner who, who puts X's in the boxes on the wall for the day they get out? I have that in my head, and the day that I get out is the day I die, all right? And what these boxes remind you of is every day you're alive, you're one day closer to death. So there's one fewer days in there to accomplish something that you might have wanted to accomplish. So I want to keep learning about our world, about each other, about things I don't otherwise know about. And there are people who only read things that they agree with or that they already know about or that it's they're, they're feeding some urge to be, uh, what's the word, to be validated. Uh, I have books on my shelf at my bedside. Every book is a subject that I either know nothing about or I completely disagree with going into the book. I said, well, maybe it'll change my mind. Learn new ideas. Okay. I once presented that list to the New York Times when they said, because I my book was doing well at one point, and they try to get authors to talk about other books to keep the, the book wheel turning because fewer people are reading today. So what books are you reading? So I, I, on your shelves, so I listed the books. One of them was uh, a book in its in his 30th printing or something. It was originally written back in the early 60s, I think, maybe even the 50s. A book by Barry Goldwater. It's called The Conscience of a Conservative. And so I'm reading this, and people wrote to me after they saw this list. They said, I didn't know you're a closet conservative. I didn't know you're really a Republican. Did you vote for Trump? And all of a sudden, people were presuming that if I'm reading a book on something, that book must be what my whole life is about rather than it's a portal to another place of how people think and what people do. So that shocked me, actually, 
that because that tells me that most people must have just books that continue to feed their own interests. And that is the best way to not grow in this world. So one of my measures of meaning is how much more do I know about the world tomorrow than I did yesterday? Because almost any path you take, take will make you wiser as a person. So I value wisdom that gives meaning to my life. A new perspective. It's not just knowledge. No. What is the arc? It's, it's there's, there's data. Data can become information. Information on further study becomes knowledge. And after enough time, when you see how the knowledge plugs in and applies, it can become wisdom. Wisdom is the distilled essence of all the details. The wisest statements ever spoken to you generally have no detail in them at all, do they? It's, it's, I've heard it said this way, wisdom is what's left over after you've forgotten all the details. <laughs> it's the distilled essence of it all. So I wanna be wiser on the porch, at, on my rocking chair. I don't wanna be the old curmudgeon. In my day, we did it best. No, I don't wanna be that guy. No. So that's one source of meaning. Another, and it's directly traceable to my parents, but I'd like to also think it's traceable to common sense, is spend a little bit of your life lessening the suffering of others. I don't mean redirect your life. Some people do. They work in soup kitchens and start not-for-profits to serve. Yes. I, I'm not that person. No, because my the universe is what calls me. But in my day, in, in a week, do something that lessens the suffering of someone else, however trifling that gesture is. And that's an infusion of good. Yeah, I'm value judging it. I'm saying, yes, it is a good thing to lessen the suffering of others. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm declaring that. I try not to ever put opinions out there, but it's my opinion that if you lessen the suffering of others, you make a better world. And don't we all wanna live in a better world? I didn't say it was wrong. I don't value judge, okay? It's not what's right or wrong here. It's, it's um, I don't live life that way because it means you carry with you the emotions. I could be happier if I were doing this, and how come I'm not? And all of a sudden, well, then I must be miserable if I'm not as happy as I could be. No, I don't measure day to day, am I happy or not? I, I, it's not the measure. Yes, it, it's in there, but that's not the metric. The metric is, am I successful at what, at what I'm doing? Am I... No, no, it's not even that. It's, am I as good at this as I can be? If you're not going to try to improve, go home. Find something else. So I remember in my first interview on national television, a new planet had just been discovered around another star, an exoplanet. It was banner headlines. We now have 5,000 in the catalog. But back then, 1995, it was banner headline, another planet. And we kind of always knew they'd be out there. We just didn't have the tools to figure it out. Uh, NBC News sent an action cam up to the planetarium. I was freshly appointed as director. They didn't know me as a person, but I carry title. And so the Chiron on the TV image gets to say, Neil deGrasse Tyson, director, Hayden Planetarium. Okay. They came up and interviewed me. Tell us about this new planet. How was it discovered? Right. So I gave my best professorial reply. Best. Oh, my gosh. It was there's a Doppler shift. The, the orbiting planet um, influences the position of the star in space. It's not just the star sits there fixed in the universe and planets orbit it. They both orbit their common center of gravity. 
And so the star, you can't see the planet, it's too dim. But you look at the star, and the star is jiggling back and forth. And I motion that with my body. And I said, and you measure this movement back and forth with the Doppler shift. You calculate it, and you can infer the existence of this planet. And bada bing, it's a planet. And I went on, I went on for like probably four times that length with my, pro, pro, and then I go home, it's national news. I get to call everybody. Hey, everybody, my friends in California, I'm going to be on TV, check it out. And so when the segment aired, all they showed was me jiggling my hips like this <laughs> and saying, it's a planet. And I said, oh, they don't want my professor reply. They want a reply that fits in their medium a soundbite medium. So let me practice that. So I went home and stared in the mirror and had people just shout out objects, names, places, people, things, and I assembled sound bites for each one of them. It's like three sentences. It's gotta be informative, makes you smile a little bit, and the information has to be tasty so that you wanna tell someone else. That's a sound bite, okay? We, we could do that now, mention anything in the universe, just just not a question, just a word, just anything. Mars. Mars. Ooh. Do you know Mars is red because it's rust? It's a rusted planet. And rust has the color of red. The whole planet, because there's a lot of iron on Mars. And red is the color of blood. Hence, Mars, the god of war. It might have life there, we're still looking. Boom! Sound bite. Venus. Okay. <laughs> Venus, the goddess of love and beauty. And Venus as an object in the night sky is stupefyingly brilliant. Until you learn it has a runaway greenhouse effect and it's 900 degrees Fahrenheit, 500 degrees Celsius on its surface. It would vaporize you. So much for the love and beauty in a Venus. So it's the, it's the least explored planet because of how hostile it is to our space probes. Boom, we got this. I'm not giving you a 10 minute lecture on the thermodynamics of Venus. So my point is, when I saw that what I did did not serve the needs, I invested a lot of energy so that I could be exactly what they needed. So that their task is simplified and I get better at something that could serve a greater good. I'm not, I don't wanna say that's happiness, I'm gonna say that's fulfillment of an objective where I improved in what it is I was doing. So what I will say is, uh, I will give one other example and I'll tie a bow on it. Uh, the first time I was invited to appear on The Daily Show, which is a very popular yeah. comedic news program in the United States, uh, hosted by um, John Stewart. John Stewart is a comedian. He's brilliant. He's very into current events. He's sharp. And I've seen politicians get interviewed by him, and they want to deliver their stump speech, and they're a deer in the headlights because he's just dancing circles around them. And on my first interview, I said, I am not going to be the deer in the headlights. Okay? So I studied his show with a stopwatch, and I said, how many seconds does he, on average, does he give his guests to speak before he comedically interrupts them? Okay, I write that down. It was anywhere between nine and 12 seconds, which doesn't sound like much, but it's, it, it works comedically, all right? Then I said, how far back in time does he reference a current event to put in a joke that he might give? Because you can't go too far back because no one remembers it. The joke has to work without you reminding people what they're supposed to know. So very intensely the, the previous day, a little less the second day. By the time of the third day in the past, there's hardly any reference to it. Okay. So I studied the last two or three days of current events. I practiced my sound bites even more to fit them into this time frame. And I get on the show and I deliver the lines. I mean, the sound bites. Oh, but I come preloaded with anything he could possibly ask me. So I'm like, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, I waddle into the studio with a utility belt's worth of thoughts and ideas that he could be asking me, okay? 
so I'm there, and if you see me on these shows, I'm a little manic because the, it's coursing through me, all this knowledge and information that I need a response to just in case he asks me. So we do this, and I get the point, and he makes the comedic point, and now my thought is not dangling in the middle of a joke because I completed the thought. The joke tightens that up, and then we move on, right? So we go through this whole interview, and he mentions the current event, and I have a little soundbitey thing about that. After the interview, people come up to me, you know what they said? They said, Neil, you're such a natural, and you have such good chemistry with Jon Stewart. My, they have no idea how much time I invested to look natural. What I'm saying is, I wanted to be as good as I possibly could have been in that interview, knowing his audience, because each host has their own audience. You want to serve their audience. I don't want to just give the stump speech. So everything that I imagined for myself was for him and his audience. I would sp communicate differently on a different talk. Daytime talk shows are different than the evening comedic news. Uh, on a documentary, it's different. So my only point of this to, with these examples are I pay attention to whether people are paying attention to me. If I'm giving you an explanation and you're drifting, all right, that's not working. Let me pull that out of the utility belt. Let me try something else. Um, if I talk about black holes in a particular way, oh, you're leaning in in the conversation. Your eyebrows are raised. That, that worked. So I have a database of people's expressions while I'm talking to them. <laughs> and, and I sift that so that I pick and choose what is most impactful in the few minutes we have together. Otherwise, I'm dragging you through a syllabus that who the hell cares? Not everything that excites me as a professional in the field will excite you. You need to know, you need to sort them into those categories. And maybe there's something that will excite me and you'll see me get all excited and you'll get giddy because you like watching me get excited. That's a different dynamic in that moment. Mm -hmm. All right. It is kind of fun. I like watching, uh, you know, I have a colleague who's like all into leeches, right? He specializes in invertebrates and leeches among them. Just to hear him talk about, I, I don't care about leeches, but he does. It's like, wow, I didn't know anyone could care that much about a blood sucking invertebrate, but it was just, I'm delighted to watch that. All right. But so you sort things that excite you from things that could excite someone else. Well, how do you know? You have to practice that, okay? Uh, strike up conversations. Watch if people care about what you say. Is there some other conversation that distracts them from your conversation with them? Well, go back to the drawing board on that one, <laughs> okay? And I also be a good listener. Watch what excites other people when they're in conversations with other people. And that's what I've done. So in that way, I'm I'm fully socialized. My parents were social creatures, and we held dinner parties often, uh, hosting conversations, and I'd watch that. Uh, I'm, I'm a kid, so I'm not, for their dinner parties, I didn't have a seat at the table. But um, the idea of being able to communicate, and my father's a sociologist, that's all he ever did, uh, that I think mattered within me, and you have to be able to read people's facial. You know what we did with my kids? Uh, it was first evidence that they were not autistic, but also I think it's good practice. Get a, when they're old enough to start thinking about human emotion, maybe eight, nine, to early, the tween years, between eight and 12, where they can actively think about what someone else thinks and feels, okay? Is the person angry? Is the person happy? Is they sad? Are they jealous? Are they whatever? Okay. So what I did was, or what you can do is find a romantic comedy that is well acted, all right? Where, where you, so you have stars that really do it right. And sit down and watch the movie with the sound off. And have your kids, ask them, what do you think, they're thinking now. What do you think she's feeling? What do you think she's saying? What do you think she's going to do next? And you just watch it. And the actors are not only delivering lines, they're feeling their roles. 
And you might have to wait. If your kid is a little slower that way, maybe they have to be 13 or 14, middle school, where your social standing begins matters more than in elementary school where you're not even, you don't even care, right? So maybe it's a middle school thing more than an elementary school thing. And that way, you can say, you thought she said, well, let's check. And you go back, and it turns out, yes, she was jealous in that moment. And so it trains you to read a facial expression, and a good actor will do this. That's what makes them good actors. And you, and you don't rely on the sound, just the visual. And it's an exercise in reading faces, reading people, reading emotions. And so you want to do this. And in The Limit, you become a full-up empath, uh, that has shaped some people's careers. Now, this is real. We're human. We're social creatures. So, yeah, I fold that in because I want to reach you. Oh, and what things do you care about? In my podcast, it's called Star Talk, I have a co-host who's a comedian, a professional stand-up comedian. And the anatomy of the podcast is... There's sort of the trinity. There's the science content, there's the humor, and there's pop culture. Why do I care about pop culture? Because you walk into the room already framed in a scaffold of pop culture. If I know that in advance, I don't have to start from scratch when I'm teaching you something. I'm going to say, oh, I have a bit of science that I can clad onto this part of your scaffold, your pop culture scaffold. And you know something, it fits, it sticks. And you say, whoa, I never knew that about this. There was an American football game that ended in a tie. and But we don't end in ties, right? So mm -hmm. there's an overtime. And you reach a point where it's sudden death overtime. Sudden death, where the next person that scores wins the game. So this person was, was ready to kick for, a, it's called a field goal, and it's 50 yards out. 50 yards, oh my gosh, okay? That's hard. So they kick it, and no one breathes for the three or four seconds the ball is, so the ball tumbles in the air, and there it goes, and everybody just follows it, and look it up, and the ball hit the left upright and careened in for the win. And I said, whoa, wait a minute. What's the orientation of this stadium? It's north-south. This is a round ball hitting a round post and going in. Do you realize round things hitting other round things, fractions of an inch make a difference? So I did a fast calculation, and then I tweeted. The Cincinnati Bengals, for the, for the sudden death field goal, was that careened off the upright was aided by a one centimeter shift to the right given to it by the rotation of the earth. People lost their minds. Okay, people, people uh, okay, the, the Cincinnati Bengals, were, the local newspaper said, God helped them win the game. It's, and so everybody, so I didn't have to say what football is, who the Cincinnati Bengals are, what a sudden death goal is, what a field goal is, or explain that the goalposts have a left and a right goalpost. I didn't have to introduce any of that. That's an example of the pop culture that someone walks into the room with and I found a bit of science that I know they're gonna care about because it touches something that's pop culture that they already care about. And I would follow that up with it's a Coriolis force and it's why storms rotate clockwise, <laughs> counterclockwise in the Northern Hemisphere. I'd follow it up with the lesson plan, but I got your interest, okay? I didn't start out that way. There's such a thing as a Coriolis force. No, no, go where they care. That's, and that's what I do professionally. Our galaxy has several hundred billion stars. And in a dwarf galaxy? Um, at most a billion, but more typically hundreds of millions. These are small numbers compared to full-up red-blooded galaxies. So tiny are dwarf galaxies, and we tend to find them in the vicinity of big galaxies, but you know what happens? You know, they orbit the big galaxy, but their orbits are not stable, and they do a death spiral in. They get eaten by the larger galaxy. And we have a term for that, it's called galactic cannibalism. 
In fact, there are stars, there are streams of stars that we see in our own galaxy that have the same trajectory as one another through the stellar system that is the Milky Way. So they, they relate, and you follow it and it comes back out and back in again. And so this is evidence that this was once a fleshy but dwarfy galaxy that we ate, ripped apart. And now the, the stars are just trying to have some, the last bastions of a memory of what they once were, because they're getting stretched apart by the, what we call the tidal forces of our galaxy. The first science essay I ever wrote was called The Galaxy and the Seven Dwarfs. <laughs> because at the time, the Milky Way had seven dwarf galaxies in orbit <laughs> around it. And then, uh, uh, but dwarf galaxies are very small, they're hard to detect. And since then we've discovered, you know, a couple dozen more. So I, we might be up above 20, two dozen dwarf galaxies it, in our vicinity, basically nearby. So the point, getting back to the void, is you look out in the void and say there's nothing there. Well, what are you invoking to declare that it's a void? Is it your eyes? Well, let's bring in a telescope. Are you using visible light? Is that a visible light telescope? Bring in an X-ray telescope, an infrared telescope. Bring in the spate of senses that science has developed that transcend the five native senses we have through our human physiology. There's a friend, I told you this is a long story, but you asked it. There was someone my age, maybe one year older, when I was in high school, who died, who was the son of a very close family friend of my parents. We might have played together as very small children, but I didn't know him as a teenager, okay? He died of brain cancer, okay, very tragic. You're 17 years old and you die of brain cancer, ready to go off to college and all the rest. They bust in school kids from the school, okay? And they unloaded and they filled this chapel. And there's a closed casket because it was, it was brain cancer. So, the, you know, it was a picture of him on the casket. And I'm watching this. And, the, you know, the, his classmates are like holding each other as they walk up the aisle. And there's the organ playing. No, it's not a New Orleans song where you sort of celebrate the life of the person who just died. It was the kind of organ music where you want to be sad that the person died. And I'm watching this. And then I start getting emotional and like a tear shows up in my eye. And I said, wait a minute, I don't know this kid. I don't even remember him. I'd be crying because the organ is making me cry. I'd be crying because I'm seeing other people who did know him cry. And I did a fast calculation. How many people are dying in this hour in the city or in the country or in the world? Am I crying for them who I equally don't know? I rationalized an emotional state out of this, this pain and misery. And I said, if I'm not tearing for everybody else who dies who I don't know, I should not be tearing for this person. And so I sucked the tears back up and just observed it anthropologically that there's a funeral going on right in front of me. That was an expression of control over my emotions. That is basically how I lived for the first 19 years of my life. What was the cost? The cost? No cost. Why would there be a cost? Why should there be a cost? to not having forced emotions by other, to, to, to no, there's, what, what cost, I'm, I'm a geek kid, okay? And emotions are something that interfere with rational thought. But this changed. So what I can say to you is, you're emotional. What's the cost for not being rational, okay? I could totally put the question back on you. What's the cost? You slammed a door. You hung up the phone back when we had phones to hung up. You slammed it down. You cried when you didn't even know the person. Okay? 
that's your cost. So we, we maybe we're simply different people. I'm not saying they shouldn't have cried. They knew him. Of course they're going to cry. I didn't. Organist, stop making me cry. And so I didn't. Okay? So, how did that change? Uh, my freshman year of college, it all changed. It all changed. First semester. I take a class in art and design. They play music and they say, draw the music. And it's like, I don't know what you're talking about. What do you mean? Feel the music and draw how it makes you feel. I say, it's just music I'm listening to. I'm like, a, it's like two ships passing in the night. I don't know what the hell this person's talking about. I don't know what he means. I don't know, you know, should I still stay in this class? What, is it a waste of time? What's going on here? And he says, okay, here's what you do. Draw the energy in the music. And excuse me, I like, I'm a physicist, right? Energy is equals MC squared. There's kinetic energy, there's mechanical energy, there's chemical energy. Energy is not what you draw out of music. Okay, okay. So I said, all right, I don't know what he's saying, but I'll try something. And then he criticizes it, okay? So I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Why am I in this class? Should I drop the class? Okay, then they roll in the pumpkins. They say, draw the pumpkins. Okay, now I can, I can do this. It's a, it's, a, it's a task. There's a pumpkin in front of me, I'm gonna draw it. So I draw pumpkins. And it takes me a few tries to get the hang of it, but I'm, I'm one of the world's best pumpkin drawers to this day because of that. We spent weeks drawing pumpkins and they're all sort of leaning on each other and they have these sort of seams in them and the, not all of them have the same size handle, the neck that comes out and some have bruises and there's like 30 of them up in the front of them, so I'm drawing them. I said, okay, uh, is, this, is this all we're gonna do with this, okay? After pumpkins became the entire meaning of my life for two or three weeks, we returned to the studio, the pumpkins are still there. And then they said, now draw the space between the pumpkins. And I just snapped. It was like, wait a minute, you're telling me that I give object and meaning, objective meaning to these things that we call pumpkins and now these pumpkins are just the boundaries to something else that I'm giving meaning to and that's the space between the pumpkins. And it was like, whoa. So I started drawing the space between the pumpkins and the pumpkins were now the edges of things, not the object of what I'm drawing. And my brain turned inside out. And I started looking around. I say, are these lights or is it a shadow that makes the shape? Am I in a space? Is the space what's real or is it the boundary of the space? If the boundary weren't there, would I still be in this space? I'd still be breathing this air, but we wouldn't call it a space because that boundary isn't there. So the bound, so my I, everything looked different after then. Everything. And from that moment onward, I could talk to artists with abstract vocabulary. How does this painting feel? What does it do for you? What do you, what are your what are your emotions? It's, it, it, it opened up a box, an emotional state that was previously non-communicative with the rest of my mind. It was kept there. I could act, it's not that I didn't know how to cry. It's just that the crying had nothing to do with anything else that was objectively real. So what they did, it, it, it found the place where it pried it open and there was spillage, there was cross spillage. So I can tell you this now, 
There's no way this sentence could have come out of my head. On my iPhone, I have skin. It's not a casing. It's just a, what's called a skin. And it is a section of Van Gogh's Starry Night. The actual name of the painting is The Starry Night. Okay? And it's got these swirly, beautiful colors. And all right. It's my favorite painting. Why? Because it's certainly not what he saw. The sky has never looked this way. But it's definitely what he felt. And for me, an artist's task, their duty in this world, not to prescribe how this, but for me, their duty is to show me the world as I do not see it. Take me someplace. Give me a perspective that will broaden my interpretation of reality. That is a thought, an idea, a sentence that could have never come out of my mouth until that moment where I drew the space between the pumpkins. And that access to abstract thinking, to now, in the early days, I'd watch a Broadway musical and two people walk up to each other speaking, uh-oh, a song is about to happen. And then they'd sing about their love for each other. I say, why don't you just cut the song, just say you love each other, move on to the next scene. That's how I felt as a child. After college, after that course, I see the two people walk up to each other and they're speaking their emotions. And I'm saying, you know, when you sing your emotions... It reaches a deeper part, not only within yourself, but within the listeners. Because there's more of your emotion expressed when you sing. And so now, I long for the song in a Broadway musical. The simplicity of expressed emotion. So I don't want to quite say I'm the opposite of what I was when I sucked back the tears in that funeral. But I'm going to say that, dare I suggest, a well-developed access to both your emotions and your rational self with some control over the two. You don't want rampant contamination, but just be able to close the door every now and then between the two and then open it, uh, I think can serve us greatly as a civilization if I were to offer perspective and advice. There are times where you need your rational self. Otherwise, you will not make a decision that's in the best interest of your health, your wealth, or your security. But don't let that hide what emotions you might have. Because the world's greatest art, as far as I can tell, issues forth from rampant emotion that we're capable of as human beings. Let me put this in context. In science, if I put a conclusion forward, it's not, you're not going to ask me, did you look at both sides of that? No, that's not the question. It's, did you look at all sides of it? We have this binarity mind where we think, are you for me or are you for us or against us? Is it black or white? Are you a boy or are you a girl? Is it up or is it down? This is intellectually lazy because practically everything that exists in this universe manifests on a spectrum. So here's a, here's a thought, and you're going to say, well, did you look at both sides? No, I looked at all sides. Did you realize that if this changes, that could change this? And did you, did you figure out how sensitive it is to that? If I didn't, I'm not doing my job as a scientist, okay? So we live in a time, especially fractured by the forces of social media. I say this only because if you post an opinion on anything in social media, it gets attacked. You know, there'll be people who agree with it, fine. But the noise and the fireworks are when you get attacked. I don't think it used to be that way. I think there was a time when I would express an opinion and you say, oh, that's interesting. Here's my opinion. Uh, so why do you think that way? And here's why I think that way. Well, that's interesting. I never thought about it that way. Cool. You, you spend 15 minutes talk, com comparing and con contrasting opinions, then you go out for a beer at the pub. This is how I remembered it? Am I misremembering? I, I, I don't think so. 
to be attacked? Now, what are the consequences? What are you actually after by attacking someone with a different opinion? Oh, I know what it is. You want everyone to have exactly the same opinion you do. Well, that's not this country either. No. You know what's on our currency? On our currency, e pluribus unum. Okay? Out of the many, we have one. Not out of the one, we have one. It is the many. It is the plurality, pluribus. Plura, pl it's Latin, okay? A plurality means people coexist who think differently about the world. And we celebrate that, or at least we ought to. Otherwise, we're all the same. And we can make a country where everybody's the same, and that's called a dictatorship. Is that really, well, really think through fully the consequences of that? It's yeah. never my intent yeah. to post a tweet that gets attacked. Of course not. If, if it gets attacked, it's like, I didn't see that coming. I, I'm, I count myself as an educator among the ranks of educators, and... My goal is to enlighten and educate, not to anger people. So I still maintain a forbidden Twitter file yeah. <laughs> on my computer. These are tweets that, no, I'm not going to post it, even though it's true, objectively yeah. true. It would be too upsetting to people. Is there another way? So anytime that happens, like, oh, my gosh, okay, let me see if I can tune that differently next time. No, no, I, I will quote my father. Okay. It's not good enough to be right you also have to be effective. If you're not effective, go home. Doesn't matter if you are in the right. So if I post something that just creates more divisiveness, I need to find another way to achieve the same goal without the conflict. So no, I'm not just about put the truth out there and if it, if it, if it, if it triggers landmines, so what, it's the truth, no. That's not being an educator. I believe, however delusionally, that you can achieve the same goal without angering people. And part of the goal of that book is to offer ways to think about points of conflict in fresh ways that do not trigger people to dig their heels in and fight more ferociously to defend their opinions. Now, I want to put this in context, because I started out by describing an idea, and you're going to say, well, did you consider both sides? No, I considered all sides. People want to think we're in the most violent times. Or can we look at the violence against trans, the trans community? First, there was always violence against trans people. But nobody was talking about it. Because there was violence against other people. There was violence against black people. There was violence against women. There's, there's a whole list of people who were more represented statistically in the world than trans people, where we went through periods of our social justice arc to try to rectify those problems. And so the fact that trans rights are on the table now is itself a measure of progress. Because we're not talking about gay marriage anymore. We're not talking under President Clinton, one of our more, more progressive liberal presidents. Do you know what the, 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 the thing was? It was gays in the military. Don't ask, don't tell. That was considered a progressive stance in the 1990s under a liberal president. Don't ask, don't tell. Now in Qatar, with the with the they say we will welcome uh, gay people, but don't exhibit the gayness in the stands, and everyone is jumping all over them for that regressive posture. It's exactly what we were thirty years ago. Don't ask, don't tell. I don't mind if you're gay, just don't kiss another man in front of me. If you're a man, I'm otherwise okay with it. All right. So what I'm saying is, look at the other things that preceded it, and you can declare progress having led up to it. That's my point. Not that it's still, you know, still have to worry about it, and it still needs solutions. And you still have to 
somehow change people's sense of what equality is and equal access and opportunity and equity and inclusion. That all still needs to happen. But that is not happening now or less so with black people. So there are measures of progress that are kind of perverse but real. And you know what my father used to say? He said, I'll know we've achieved equality when a black person can be indicted for embezzlement of funds. <laughs> when a black person can be sent to jail for embezzling $500 million, I know we've made it, okay? <laughs> okay? Like I said, it's a perverse measure, but it's, it's another way to think about the progress that has actually happened in this world. All I'm saying is, we may be living in some of the safest times there ever was in the history of civilization. I don't think we should lose sight of that. People are afraid to say it, I think, because the worry, and it's an authentic, a, a, a legitimate worry, that you might just get complacent and sit back and say, see, everything is fine. It requires no more work and no more effort. I'm saying maybe in addition to worrying about the violence that persists to this day, we should look at the successes and say, well, what did we do right? Let's do more of that. And there's not much of people saying, look how far we've come. Let's list how we achieve this. Wow, this is very... Marvel Comics of you. What's the origin story of <laughs> Superman, Batman, Spider-Man? Uh, your question is very well placed because everyone has been touched by some series of events. Unfortunately, some for some people, traumatic events, but for all people, some series of events that shaped who they are. And I'd like to say that there was a series of events that planted the seeds of who I would become, but I, I wouldn't say that they were responsible. I mean, it requires a lot of continual investment of time, energy, and focus to shape a career rather than say, oh, it happened then and I've just been coasting ever since. No, that's not how that works. So I, I grew up in the Bronx and in New York City, surely as is true in London, you don't have a relationship with the night sky. In a busy city, you, at least in, certainly in New York City, there were tall buildings. If you look up to see the sky, there's a building in the way. There's light pollution. There's, and back then there was air pollution. So since no one has a relationship with, with the night sky, then one can ask, what is your access to it? Of course, it's our local planetarium, the Hayden Planetarium. And I, my family, my parents, my brother and sister, there was a tactical strategic thing my parents did. I, I didn't know it at the time, but every weekend or every other weekend, we went places. We were exposed to all manner of things that talented adults do beyond just the doctor, lawyer, you know, engineer, beyond those standard professions. So first it was entertaining, but it also meant we had exposure to other ways of thinking about what you might do with your life. One of those trips, when I was nine years old, was to the Hayden Planetarium. And I was starstruck. <laughs> you sit in a big chair and the lights dim and the stars come out, more stars than you can count. And I thought it was a hoax. I said, there aren't that many stars. I've seen the night sky from the Bronx. <laughs> You're lying to me. Uh, and only later would I learn upon going deep into the rural areas of the country. We have relatives in the Caribbean. We visited there. I'd see the night sky as nature intended. And to this day, when I have access to great telescopes on mountaintops, and I look up at the crystalline, clear night skies, I still say to myself, oh, that is so beautiful. It reminds me of the Hayden Planetarium. Mm. <laughs> so it's a, uh, I know that's kind of a sad commentary on what it is to grow up in a city, but it's, 
I feel like the universe chose me. And since I was nine years old onward, I have committed my life to learning more and more about the universe. And that that's the, the most important seed that was planted. Death, uh, it, it, death comes up as a, as a topic of conversation commonly when we talk about prolonging life. And now that we're into the genome and into human physiology, might there be a day where you can live forever, okay? And there's something called the generation that will have escape velocity. Do you know what that is? Okay, I'll tell you what it is. So in the last 50 years, we've increased life expectancy 20 years. In the last 10 years, we've increased life expectancy by five years. So there will be a time where in the last year, we increase life expectancy by a year. At that moment, homo sapiens have achieved escape velocity from death. Okay, that generation will never die unless you're hit by a bus, <laughs> okay? So, that brings to you the question, if you could live forever, would you? And my reply to that, and I don't want to answer for other people. So this is my, I want to be very clear that yes, I have my opinions, but I don't care if you share my opinions. You should have your own opinions, okay? My outlook on this is, well, let's take, for example, a bouquet of flowers. If you buy a bouquet of flowers and hand them to your loved one, and the bouquet, the flowers are made of plastic, how would your loved one reply to that? They, they probably think you don't love them. But you say, but darling, they'll last forever. <laughs> okay. No, that's not the variable here. That's not what matters. The fact that flowers die is the very reason why they have meaning as a gift. You're handed flowers. They're going to be dead in seven days. That means, you know, you better pay attention to them. You're going to smell them. You're going to take care of them. You're going to make sure you change the water and trim the stems. And you're going to put it in a central place so that not only you see them, but so does everybody else. You're going to celebrate those flowers while they are alive because the day is gonna come very quickly where they're gonna die. And in their senescence, you're gonna nurse them through as the neck gets a little weak on the stem. You might try to prop them up until they're gone. It is the fact that they're gonna die that gives them meaning as a gift. And dare I say, that my knowledge that I'm gonna die gives not only meaning to my being alive, it gives urgency to it. On my deathbed, I do not want to regret having the interest and ability to have solved a problem that I did not solve. Uh, to have an experience that I could have had, but then I did not. Knowing I'm going to die means I'm going to wake up in the morning and I'm going to be all about action. Action. I, if, I will tell people I love them if I love them. I will uh, accomplish things. I will learn this thing I wanted to learn. I will do all I can. Because you know what I want on my tombstone? It's a quote from a famous American educator of two centuries ago. His name is Horace Mann. He was also a university president, I think it was. He gave a commencement speech, one of his last. And he says to the graduates, I beseech you. Love that word. Nobody uses that word anymore, beseech. Shakespeare loved it. I beseech you to treasure up in your hearts these my parting words. Be ashamed to die until you have scored some victory for humanity. I want that on my tombstone. I don't want any other monument but that on my tombstone. If everyone lived to that goal, oh, 
how different the world would be, how enriched it would be with people's energy to improve the lot, not only of others as individuals, but of your neighborhood, your society, civilization itself. So that's what I think of when I think of death. By the way, in there I reference dogs. There's a dog over there called Laika. Laika, where have I heard that name? Laika. 65 years ago, Laika orbits Earth. Uh, the first animal to orbit Earth. Then there's some guinea pigs, and then there were some chimps, and then Yuri Gagarin orbits the Earth, the first human. I think he was the seventh mammal to orbit the Earth. <laughs> I had to check my notes on this, but there was, uh, if you add up mammals, we're, humans were very late in the, in the space achievement scale. So when you come home for having been away, if you own a dog, you will know exactly what I'm describing. By the way, this does not happen with cats. So with a dog, the dog is happy to see you. Not just happy, hey, glad you're home. It's they jump up and down and they want to lick your face and they want to jump into your lap if it's a lap dog. And if it's a if it's an Irish wolfhound, they'll want to knock you over and lick you in the face. They're excited by you. First, I would ask, did you do anything that day that deserved that praise? <laughs> All right. So one famous quote is, be the person the, your dog thinks you are. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's a high bar, let me say. But there's the, and by the way, if you go out to just check the mail and come back, the dog is happy to see you. So now wait a minute. Well, why? Uh, let me just make up a reason, okay? I'm just pulling this out of my ass. You ready? Okay. Uh, dogs don't live as long as we do. The famous dog year calculation. There's some nuances to it, but the blunt calculation is one dog year is seven human years, okay? So when a dog is 10, they're like 70, all right? When a dog is 12, they're 84. They're getting ready to die, okay? Dogs die between age basically 12 and 16, okay? All right. Wait a minute. If it's a factor of seven difference, it means... We live an entire week of our lives for every single day a dog lives. So maybe the dog knows it won't live as long as we will. Maybe it knows it's got a truncated life expectancy relative to humans. Maybe it knows it's got to make every day count. We could languish away five days out of the week. You still have the other two days to watch football with your friends. The dog doesn't have that luxury. So I'm making this up. I'm going to declare that dogs know that every day of their lives matter. And therefore, they're going to make it count. And they're going to be happy every day. You ever wake up to a dog that's depressed? Never. Uh, no, no. You know, I'll walk myself today. Don't worry about it. I'll feed myself. I'm, I, I don't want to eat. I'm, no, they've been sick. All right? That's how you know they're sick. They're not licking you in the face. That's a sad day for the dog. But then they pop back. Dogs don't stay sick for long because they live seven times faster than we do. <laughs> Have you ever taken a dog to the vet and they perform surgery on the dog? Okay. Uh, yeah. You know where I'm going here? They perform surgery. The next day, the dog is out running around in the park. I've seen dog with the leg amputated. Amputated leg. And the next day, they're a little slower, but they're kind of walking around and they still want to lick you in the face. And they're as good as new after three days. If we had one of our legs amputated, oh my gosh, I'm still in the hospital a month later. Dogs live in the fast lane. And maybe they know it. And so I want to think to myself, 
no, I'm not licking people in the face, but I want to experience the joy and the urgency that dogs do simply by being alive.